that doesn't walk in this way, that doesn't use the names or celebrate his feast days or do his Sabbath, they should not be able to condemn us or blame us or accuse us or pass judgment on us in anything because we are not doing anything wrong. The same thing is said of, in 1 Timothy 3, 2, you don't have to turn there, but I have a skip bit from here. When Paul was speaking to the bishops, he mentioned in 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop then must be blameless or above condemnation. He also mentions in Titus 1, 7, and write that down, in Titus 1, 7, the same thing, a, for a bishop must be blameless. Now, does that just apply to the bishops? Does that just apply to the deacons and the leaders of a church? No. It is very, more, very much more important for them to be blameless because they are in front of the people. They are the leaders of the church. They are the ones that people would look up to and so they should show that leadership that they are doing everything right in the eyes of Yahweh. But it applies to everyone in this world. Just because Paul is singing out, singling out for bishops, it does not mean that the young man or the bishops, or even in 1 Timothy 3.10, he goes on to say, and let these also first be proven. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Not just deacons, not just bishops, not just overseers, not just pastors, not just everybody, or we should strive to be blameless. And so obviously we have to define blameless. What does it really mean to be blameless? And then we have to define perfection or perfect. What does it really mean to be perfect? So I have the definitions here. Blameless is defined as innocent of all wrongdoing. Innocent of all wrongdoing. Pretty straightforward and then. I've done nothing wrong. Perfect, however, is a little more stringent in its definition. Have all, having and perfect is defined as having all the required and desirable elements, qualities, or character. Having all the required or desirable elements, qualities, and characters. And so you might say, to well, David, I don't see really a difference between that. Having all the qualities and characters and being innocent of all wrongdoing is kind of hand in hand. And I agree. It's kind of the same thing. But in my mind, and this is basically my opinion, those that are perfect have never done anything wrong. Those that are blameless are innocent of any wrongdoing. You notice the difference there. To have never done anything wrong or to have maybe done something wrong but are shown to be innocent of that wrong. So you still have a clear Wasn't the Messiah the pinnacle of example that will push? Wasn't the Messiah <laughs> wasn't the Messiah the pinnacle of example of that being done perfectly? Yes. His character. Yes. And that's where we're going next, Carl. <laughs> okay. Who can we think about besides Yahshua? Because we all know that Yahshua was perfect. He came here to be perfect. Who can we think of in Scripture that was also considered perfect? Curtis. That's right, Daniel and his buddies. Daniel and his buddies? I didn't think about that. Because they had to be perfect in order to be saved from the fire. So their spirit has had to be the strong. All the other action can be blamed. No blameless. Noah. That's the first, that's the first one I have. Noah. Let's consider first. And we're going to talk about that next. Any any others? No. Job. I do have Job second. Job is considered to be perfect. Even though Yahweh allowed him to be tested. He was blameless and perfect. Yeah, Stephen. Chris. Stephen. Stephen. Uh I would say his his ability to see heaven before his death mm -hmm. allowed him some 
quality of not being blamed or blameless, even though they were really accusations that were false against him. Elijah, yes, that's the last one. I was hoping somebody did that. Elijah and Enoch, I have those as like supplemental because you have to be perfect for Yahweh to take you away <laughs> prematurely before you die, as scripture says, in a whirlwind or just disappear. There had to be some level of perfection or definitely a level of not being blamed or blameless. Yes. Oh, I thought you wanted to go ahead. Oh, Elijah and uh, Mark. Yeah, Elisha was so developed spiritually, if you recall, brethren, that he initially, after he sold all his oxen, like we'd get rid of a whole fleet of BMWs or whatever in that era, and he was there just to wash the hands of Elijah as a servant. What kind of example of servanthood is that? Mm -hmm. Just there to, to wash the prophets? Hands for it. Right. Yeah. And so, is perfection possible? Yes. Is it attainable? Yes. Is it easy? <laughs> I think everybody here agrees that it is not easy. And as I mentioned earlier, the difference between being perfect and being blameless is. Can anyone say, besides the people we just named and Yahshua, from their birth to their death, mm. they were perfect in all their ways? <laughs> and if you can't say that you were perfect in, or you are perfect in all your ways since your inception into this world, then you have to strive to be blameless. Mm. I know a lot of talking to Brother Lot, and he's like, yeah, but we still can be perfect because Yahshua says, be perfect as your father was per is perfect. So it's possible for us to be perfect. We can wash away all of the previous things that we've done and still try to strive to perfection. And that is totally true. And because of Yahweh's mercy, he forgets everything that we've done in the past. And we become a new but how hard is it to stay perfect? How hard is it to always do what is right, regardless of the situation? It is extremely hard. So then we think about how do we become blameless? Because if we stumble and fall, and we repent, and we never do it again, then it's still quite a stain. Yahweh will forgive it, and he will forget it, but we are striving to be blameless in anything else going from forward. Now, I don't want to discourage anybody that you've lost your perfection when you fall off the path, but you have to start over and be perfect going forward. Yes, thank you. Matthew 19.21. Matthew 19.21, do I have that? I do not have that. Matthew 19.21, that's true. He was speaking to the young fellow. Do you Matthew, know what to do? Yeah. What must I do? Just, just Matthew 19.21 or what? Yeah. So Matthew 19.21 says, Joshua said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. <laughs> Another thing, or an example that Yahshua gave to be perfect is to give up all you have for Messiah. Now back then he's saying, evidently that guy had a lot of stuff, so that's your idol, give it up. Then they come follow me, and then you can be perfect. Today we would translate to that is giving up everything we've done and had and basically hold dear in the past whether it's family, friend, personal, game, jobs, that have us to work on the Sabbath. Desire. Desires. Desires. To follow Yahweh and Yahshua so that we can get on the path to be perfect. And if nobody's perfect, if we stumble 
And if we fall, we get up, dust ourselves off, work it out with the Father, and get back on the road and make sure that we cannot be blamed or blameless going forward. Because who's out there accusing us constantly? The adversary. See, 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 see? I knew he wouldn't do it right. He can't do it. He's not going to follow you the rest of his life. Look at him. He's doing wrong right now. But what should we think about? Yeah, I stumbled, but I got to pick myself back up. And I'm working out what I need to do in order to be blameless in the eyes of God. We should not get discouraged when we do something wrong or fall off. We should immediately recognize it and turn back. Figure out what we need to do positive, what we need to do based on what Yahweh wants us to do. Immediately turn and do that. And not even think about what happened in the past. Because once Yahweh forgives you, is he bringing up old stuff? Is he pointing back, well, you know I forgave you last week, but before that, you did this, this, and this. No, he's not going to point that out. It's not even something that he would bring up. Because what would that do? That would discourage his people. And is he in the business of discouraging any of us in our walk? No, he is in the business through his words of uplifting us in our walk. When the, Messiah, when the Messiah spoke to the people and he helped, whenever he did anything for, for anybody, he, the, the words out of his mouth were, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. Always go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. So, and what we know, just because we're in the flesh, we are sinners. You, you're going to be a sinner because you're in the flesh. You're born into sin. Because you're born into it. And then all we have to do is make sure that when we repent, that we strive to sin no more. Right. Being blameless. Just to confirm what my brother just said, the scriptures say a righteous person falls, he shows a complacent seven times in a day. Mm -hmm. And it says that Yahweh is the one who lovingly picks them up to, to move forward. Higher and higher. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. All right, so let me get back on track. I'm try to keep this short. Let me know uh, once again. Uh, let's turn to Genesis nine, uh, six nine. So I gotta have scriptures to back up what I'm saying. Let's turn to Genesis six nine. So first, we're gonna talk about who the scripture specifically states was perfect. Yeah, let's talk about Noah first. And then we're not going to read a whole lot of scriptures here. We're just going to get to the point because obviously, like I said, I'm setting the stage, the foundation to where I'm going. So Genesis 6, 9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with Elohim. So I'll stop there. It mentions Noah being perfect in his generations. It doesn't just say Noah was perfect. So a lot of time, the, the school of thought here is Noah's lineage, his bloodline, was not tainted. Mm -hmm. It was perfect. That could be the case. You know, I'm not going to argue, argue with that. But the task that Yahweh gave Noah, his ability to speak to <laughs> Yahweh, his ability and instructions to build the ark, his ability to save two of all and seven of all clean and his family from the flood. I think he was kind of uh, good in what he did for Yahweh or blameless or maybe perfect. Because I will tell you, and I think I'm afraid I don't want to trump your discussion later, but back then it was a lot easier to be perfect in your walk with Yahweh than it is now. Grandma gave me an article in the book about the stuff that they're putting in our food. Mm -hmm. And if you don't read up and know about it, can you say that, oh, I'm blameless because I've never eaten anything unclean? Mm -hmm. 
the adversary is trying to prevent that. That's right. He's trying to stop you from saying that you are blameless in that aspect. Whereas back then they grew their own food. You know, they went to bed when the sun went down. It was a lot easier for them to walk with the op perfectly throughout their entire life. Much simpler back then, in my opinion. Right now, with all of the stuff that we have, technology, media, mass-produced food, shoved down our throats, it's not good for us. It is hard to be perfect, but can we be blameless? So it'll kind of get there. So, yes, I think Noah walked with Yahweh. You know, he walked with Yahweh in such a way that Yahweh deemed him to not only be perfect in his generation, but with what he did, there had to be some level of perfection in his walk with Yahweh, my opinion. Let's go to Job 1. Job 1.1. 1, 1. Job 1.1 1, 1 doesn't pull any punches. It's just straight up. No guesswork. Job 1, verse 1, and we're just going to read one verse here. Job 1, 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared Elohim and eschewed evil. That man was perfect and upright. He surpassed being blameless. The day he was born, or let me correct that, from the day he was accountable for his actions to the day he died, Job was considered perfect. And again, I think back then, much easier task to do than what we have now. And the fact that it's harder for us to do it now means we have to work harder to try to be blameless. All right, the last one I have, let's go to Genesis 17, verse 1. Genesis 17, verse 1. And we're going to switch to you. After this, we'll talk about how do we be perfect. What does that entail? Because I can't get up here and tell you to be perfect and not explain to you how you should be perfect. Yeah, I'm, it's my opinion. Even though it might appear harder, the fact the resources are more, the fact that we have the set apart spirit and Yahweh and Yeshua living in us give us gives us more resources. And back in Noah's day, I mean all everyone's wicked to the point that Yahweh was going to destroy it. So it is attainable. Yes, it is attainable to yeah. tell everybody what we're saying. We have more resources now, we have the Bible, we have the set apart spirit that was given yeah. to us. So it's almost like Yeshua knew how hard it would be. We're yeah. equipped. And we're more equipped. We're fully equipped they were back then. So he's prepared us for the level of difficulty that we're working in right now. This is so important. I was thinking about this thinking about this yesterday, what you were saying with you know, But all that's coming down the world, the time of trouble coming since it's not since the beginning of the world or ever shall be again this mess rain, this tribulation. Scripture says that when sin is abounding, apparently it's what's predicted, we're promised to counter Failing effect is his grace. We can have enhanced our perfection. Certainly, being blameless is supposed to super about to his glory. Yes. As we get closer to tribulation, it is definitely going to be unlike any time ever. So, Genesis 17 1, really quick here, just two verses. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty Elohim. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So first thing somebody say, well, it doesn't, David doesn't say he was perfect. Yahweh's telling him to be perfect. But then we got to keep reading. And it goes on to say, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Did Yahweh do what he said he was going to do for Abraham? So if Yahweh lived up to his end of the bargain, yeah. that means Abraham lived up to his end of the bargain. Being perfect. Easy. That's not hard. Yes. As far as, it can, as, far as you can read, though, it was from that point on. 
before that he, he may not have been perfect. Yes, I will address that because we know and if we believe the Apocrypha and lost books, he was told to come away from his family to get out of his land for a reason. And what was that reason? We assume that his dad was an idol maker and everybody in the land was pretty wicked. Idolaters and he was told to get away from there so he can be perfect going forward. And here, actually, uh, before, and that goes back to us, when we make our covenant with Yahshua and Yahweh, when we are immersed into the names, into this wall, that is our opportunity to be perfect. And going back to what I said, even though you might stumble, even though you might fall, you have repentance, you have mercy, and you have forgiveness from Yahweh, and then you have the job, so to speak, to be blameless in all your ways going forward. And try to obtain perfection. But you read to us Genesis 17, 17. It seems to confirm what Ted just said. Genesis 17, 17. Ted, but Genesis 17, 17. Hold on, let me get there. Genesis 17, 17. Genesis 17, 17 says, Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred and two years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And it doubt. 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 Oh, yes. He <laughs> had doubt whether that was going to happen. And it's funny, it's not. He didn't doubt that he was going to make his seed the sand of the call. He just doubted up front. How are you going to give, how am I going to have a child? Of this age. But regardless of that doubt, he lived up to his bargain. Yahweh lived up to his bargain. Mm -hmm. And we can take that as Abraham was perfect. Right. So we've given three examples besides Yahshua and the others that we mentioned. Three solid examples in scripture of where it says a person was or can be perfect in their walk with Yahweh. So now let's switch gears and talk about what must we do to be perfect. It's easy to say. But give me the actual keys. Give me the instructions, as uh, Curtis talked about in his study, on how to do that. Don't just say it. Show it. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 8, 9. Deuteronomy 8, 9. We're going to list a few verses here. Because Deuteronomy 8, 9 can be applied to what's happening today. Deuteronomy 8 9. It's not specifically something that we can say translate 100% to today, but the concept itself, I think, is applied. Yes, Trey. Uh, Grab the mic. Grab the mic. <laughs> oh, all right. Just real quick before you switch over, um, continue reading in Genesis 17. You see that he also, every man in his camp, all his children, um, everybody, they got uh, circumcised right after that uh, moment of doubt that he had. So you can say that right there would have been like his uh, repentance, or uh, like a sacrifice of your flesh to cut off that, um, to do the circumcision of his own uh, uh, foreskin. Okay. That is part of the requirement, yes. So, being perfect, circumcision, covenant. Yeah. If you continue to do it, I'll live up to my bargain. Yahweh did that through his sons. All right, where am I? Deuteronomy 18.9. <laughs> Deuteronomy 18.9. 18, 18. Deuteronomy 18. Verse 9. Sorry about that. I got my braces in. <laughs> Either I can talk or I can't talk. There's certain things I can't say. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. So, what must we do to be perfect? <laughs> Yahweh tells those, uh, the Israelites, as they're going to the, to the land, Deuteronomy 18.9, When thou have come into the land which Yahweh thy Elohim giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. So I put this first is because when we get on this walk, we can't be looking back at to what people are doing in the world. And we definitely can't mimic what they're doing in because if we mimic or do what they are doing, 
after we've come back or come out of that, come out of her, my people, then what have we done? Going right back in. Going right back in or tarnish anything or any perfection that we have actually built up through our immersion in Yahshua Messiah. It's gone. No longer perfect. Yes, David. That strengthens the, the fact that we have, have to be, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Yes. You can live here. This is not our permanent residence. Yes, Ron. Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12 and 2. Hold on. Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12, verse 2. Right. Romans 12 2. If you guys are already there, Romans 12 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of Yahweh. Thank you, Bob. That's perfect. That perfect will of Yahweh. Yeah, I don't have that one. Huh. Yeah. I missed that one. <laughs> that was perfect in line because the will of Yahweh is for us to be set apart, to be different, to be a peculiar people. And I, actually, I'm trumping myself already now in talking about that. Is that to be sort of like Yahweh, but also having the characteristics of those out in the world? No, that's not what that means. That means being 100% wholeheartedly doing and following the will of Yahweh. <clears throat> so we can't have worldly tendencies. We can't have worldly tendencies. We can't have, you know, the worldly mindset and the worldly actions and the worldly behavior seeping into our perfect wall. Because if we do, then it is no longer perfect. So I'm going to keep reading here because Yahweh basically tells them if they do this, what will they be? So verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son and his daughter to pass through the fire. Now we know that we're not going to do that. It's not something we're going to do. But if you let your children just run amok in the world and you don't watch and guard them from the things that are happening in the world, are you letting them pass through the world of fire? Proverbially, yes. Proverbially, yes. I'm being funny right now, but I told you guys this kind of can be translated into today. Not the same thing, but adversary just has a different way of doing the same tricks. And then it goes on to say, or if that uses divinations, we know what's going on in the world, Hollywood and all of that stuff. Yes. All right, going, to, going to what you said a moment ago, that uh, reading Peter, it says the world and everything in it is reserved for fire. The world so and everything in know what the destination of all of this is. Yeah. If you sit in the world too long, you are destined to pass through that fire. Now, will you make it up on the other side? Probably not. But those of us that have a perfect walk will make it to the other side. Change to be like him. Thank you, Robert. Uh, going on says, those that use divinations and observe times and uh, an enchanter or witch or a charmer or a consultant or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto Yahweh and because of these abominations Yahweh thy Elohim doth drive them out before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with Yahweh thy Elohim. So don't do what the other nations do. Don't do what the people of the world do. Happy Halloween, right? Amen. No, no happy Halloween. <laughs> oh, that is exactly what I did. I didn't think about that, Curtis. All of these characters we just mentioned, somebody will let their kid dress up as them for the upcoming Hallows Eve. We're not to do that. We are to separate ourselves, be set apart, and follow Yahweh and be perfect. Verse 14, I'll just continue reading. For the nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times and unto div diviners. But 
as for thee, Yahweh thy Elohim have not suffered thee so to do. Can't do it. So the first thing of being perfect is kind of our first step in our walk, is to come out of her, my people. To come out of the evil that's in the world, come out of what's happening in the nations. You gotta do that first before you do it. Being perfect with Yahweh is not doing what the world does, not, as we mentioned, being like the world, but doing what Yahweh says. And we just actually just read, this, I mean, sang the song of Psalms 19.7. You don't have to turn there. Just one you know, verse, Psalm 19.7 says, the law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. So that's where we're going next, after we talk about David, but... <coughs> Yahweh's law is perfect. So once we come out of her, then what is our job to be perfect? To do his law. Let's turn to 2 Samuel 22, 31. 2 Samuel 22, 31. This is David's song to Yahweh. 2 Samuel 22, 31. Second Samuel 22, 31 says, As for Elohim, his way is perfect. So if Yahweh's way is perfect, how do we become perfect? Following his way. Following his way. It goes on to say, the word of Yahweh is tried. It's sure. He is a buckler to all of them that trust in him. For who is Elohim, save Yahweh? And who is a rock save our Elohim? Yahweh is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. We don't make our own way perfect. It is Yahweh who makes our way perfect through his word. So once we come out of the world, once we put our foot on the path, it is upon us to be perfect by doing his will, the whole law. Everything he's commanded of us. Not just a little bit. Not just when it's convenient. Not just when we know and observe and can analyze ourselves to know exactly what we're doing is right. It's at all cost and all time because if we can't do it in all situations and circumstances, we're no longer perfect. And that goes to what we're going to talk about in a second. Then we have to just Make sure we're blameless. Yahweh makes all of our ways perfect through his word. But there's also another aspect that we have to work on. Not just our actions and doing his law. We have to work on our hearts. Let's turn to 1 Chronicles 28, 9. 1 Chronicles 28, 9. Because what dictates our actions? Our heart. What comes out of the heart is what, is what can devour man. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. There's one verse here. And this is David talking to his son, trying to prepare him for ruling. First Chronicle 29, David was telling Solomon, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the Elohim of thy fathers, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. Not just with perfect actions, but a perfect heart, which in my opinion dictates your actions. And a willing mind. If you have a willing mind, a perfect mind, all of your thoughts, everything that comes out of your heart, that goes to your thoughts, and your thoughts, and your brain telling you to do actions, all of that is following and abiding by Yahweh's will. Now we're getting into the deep end. Now we're getting to the hard stuff, the nitty gritty. You come out of all of that wickedness, not doing what the nations are doing, 
trying to live up to the law, you're reading and studying the law, you got it memorized, I should do this this time, I should do this this time, I should do this this time. But you're still not perfect until your heart and in your mind is also perfect. Because what did Yeshua say when he was trying to tell them to take that next step to the spiritual side of their walk? Those who commit adultery, it is said that you shouldn't do it. But I say to you, those that have a lustful look on a woman has committed adultery in his heart. And we will be condemned for that. So it's taking that next step to carve out and cut out any imperfections that we have in our heart and in our mind. And that way we don't have to think about if we're doing the right thing. We don't have to catch ourselves in those emotional, com emotionally compromised situations. We know that everything that proceeds out of our heart and our mind is going to be clean and pure and based on what Yahweh wants us to do. That's that next step. And that's that step to perfection in my mind and in my opinion is how we can become continue to be perfect in God. So you don't have to turn there. I mentioned it earlier, Matthew 5, 48. Yeshua basically gave advice, commandment, whatever you want to call it. And he said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Can Yahweh have evil come out of his heart? No. Yeah. Can Yahweh think evil upon any of his creation? No. Does Yahweh do evil? No. He allows it to happen, but he doesn't do it. So if we're to be perfect like him, who sits in heaven, he separated himself from evil, he doesn't think evil thoughts, he doesn't, evil doesn't come out of his heart, and he doesn't do any evil actions perfect. Can't help but being perfect. <laughs> exactly. At some point being perfect begins or, I'm not going to say that just yet, Yahweh and Yahshua have no choice but to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Yahshua is an extension of his father. He can't do anything but what his father has commanded him to do. Man has to strive to be perfect. And if they fall short of that, then their job is to be blameless. Oh, Niels. Yeah. I think you need to back up a little bit on your evil. Talking about Isaiah 45 7. Actually, Isaiah 45 7. Now we can't misread it and think the paradigm of the mind that we as humans have. Mm -hmm. It's his purpose, his ways. Isaiah 45 7. Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Yahweh, do all these things. For him to carry out his purpose and his way. In our mind, we think in our paradigm, thinking that well, he killed all those babies, or he killed all those people, or he killed that nation. It's his ways. His ways are not our ways. Right. So when we read this, we have to be Stop careful sure. when it says, and create evil. Yes, you're exactly right. Because right. when I read this, I read, Yahweh created everything. It's all good. And it is all good. Right, all good. The contrast between good is evil. So, obviously, if he created everything, he created the ability for evil to exist. Amen. He allowed evil to persist. Yeah. Anyway. Go. Oh. <laughs> no problem. Um, we also have to realize that what he's saying, he says, he always says he would do us good. This evil here is raw. And basically, what is this evil to us? Yahweh is right. still not Yahweh doing, it's not Yahweh evil, but when we, the penalty for sin is death, um, the penalty for disobedience. Whatever happens is evil to us because it's more just evil. It's like it's bad, unpleasant, you know, things. 
It is to us, because that's a consequence of disobedience, which I was saying when he does things, he can be for our good or to our punishment, which is raw or evil to us. It's not describing who he is. Um, and so it's, it's, it's all in relation to us. So to, I mean, what Neil's saying is right, but just to, to clarify, it's, it, it, we're looking at a perspective of God's relationship to us and how he relates to us. He does things for us for our good. There are also things that are done which is too our <coughs> bad, to, 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 if that's even to us, to punish. Yes. So to, to clarify. Yep. Yeah, that's what, how do we have free will if we can't have an opportunity to choose between good and evil? Choose life rather than death. Because there's no yeah, that, That's where I was going. Shut <laughs> <laughs> yeah. my mouth. That's okay. You know, I like the point. The only the same because Yahweh says I will bring the people upon you. It's not. It's, 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 it's the consequence of, of our choices our or our choice. sin or whatever. Exactly. So to us, it's, it's, this here in, in, in Isaiah is relative to us. We have to remember that it's not Yahweh does evil himself. He yeah. Does not. He but he created the scenario of this world. And the choice, and if there's a choice, there has to be a negative side of that choice. Mm -hmm. And the evil that happens between man, the adversary, the fallen angels, all of that stuff, that is a choice that they make. Yeah. And another, and hold on, Robert, another point that we've discussed, and I know we're kind of getting off the rails here, but this is good, good topic. Uh, I think it was Ahab when, you know, the evil spirit said, or Yahweh says, who's going to go to him and convince him to do such and such, whatever it was. And the evil spirit said, I'll go and I'll do it. Yahweh do it? No. That spirit volunteered to do evil. Yahweh didn't do it and he didn't command him to do it. He just said, who would do it? It was around to go to war and get killed. Exactly. So, uh, Robert and then Tina. Yeah, and again, it, it's that, that Yow, everything falls under Yahweh's authority, everything. And so even when the adversary rebelled against Yahweh, he allowed him to exist for his purpose. Right. That's right. And so but there, there, since Yahweh does no evil thing, he had this deep, that the adversary at the moment that he corrupted himself, Yahweh allowed him to remain for his purpose. Yeah. And that just reminds me of Judas Iscariot. In order for Yahshua to fulfill what he came to do, adversary had to enter into Judas and make that decision to sell him out. Mm -hmm. So Yahshua didn't do anything. He didn't tell him to go do it. That was his choice. All right. Oh, Tino. Sorry about that. Esau. when the lion spirit went to Esau and said that spirit, evil spirit, was for Yahweh. Yahweh has sent us. Oh, the spirit to King Saul is another one. It wasn't that it was Yahweh, it was that the spirit that, that was in Saul already, he was already doing bad things. That spirit went to him. So it was just another you know, example, too, of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know Satan has a Yeah, and so, yeah, that's kind of back up that statement. We have actually had this discussion a couple of times. <laughs> and so uh, I, I'm glad you bring it up because I don't want to say something to people like, where did he get that from? Uh, it's in the back of my mind just comes out that way. And I do need to explain and describe and back up what I'm saying. So thanks, Neil. All right, where was I? Uh, Matt, oh, uh, Long. Deuteronomy 30, Deuteronomy 30, 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I have it highlighted, so thank you, Long. <laughs> Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed might live. There is a choice we all have to make. And for us, when we make that choice, that choice comes with a requirement, and that requirement is for us to be perfect in all of our ways. Thank you, Bob. So, man must strive to be perfect. Fall short, it's an impossibility. Not this is impossible uh, with Yashua, Yashua, but if it's too hard, then we are to strive to be blameless. And at some point, after this statement in Scripture, I can't recall any other thing, and I might have missed it, you know, I am human, I might have missed it, but there was a switch to scripture, no longer saying people were perfect, 
but saying that people were blameless. And so I always have questions. And you know, obviously the question stuck out. When I'm reading and searching, and I can't find perfect or someone being perfect after Yahshua made this statement in Matthew 5, 48, what was the change? I can only speculate because the scripture doesn't say, but could it be that that change was because perfection was no longer happening, thus Yahshua had to come? Yeshua yeah. had to come and do what he had to do because if he procrastinated or Yahweh held back any longer, it just was going to get worse. And we're looking at Noah's time all over again. He had to come and be the salvation, be the repentance, be the mercy and the forgiveness for Yahweh for us who are sinners so that we can at least be blameless. If his people can't be perfect, they better sure well be blameless. And one of the examples that I have, let's turn to Luke 1, 5. Luke 1, verse 5. Because I was like, surely Mary, no pun intended, was perfect. <laughs> surely Joseph was mentioned in Scripture to be perfect, and it wasn't. But what I did found, find was John's parents. John the Baptist, that is. Parents was mentioned. Let's go to Luke 1, verse 5. Just a couple of verses here. There was in the day of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, of, of and his wife was a daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before Elohim, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of Yahweh blameless. Walking in all of the commandments and ordinance of Yahweh blameless. Could it have been that they weren't perfect, but they did everything they needed to do? They may have stumbled, they did everything they needed to do to turn around, to be blameless in Yahweh's eyes. If anybody was to see them, they would not be able to reel accusations against them. They would not be able to condemn them. They would not judge them. Yeah, so Zechariah uh, fell the same, I guess, test as Abraham, because right after he was declared oh, blameless, yes. it was the... <laughs> You know, you're going to have a child, and he had that same doubt. Yeah, so, doubt that he was going to have a child yeah. in his old age, yeah. and he was freaking blind. Boy, doubt. Yeah, yeah, and uh, verse 18. <laughs> Could that be, oh, you don't have the faith to believe? I can do what I said I can it's do? Like right after. <laughs> yeah, so he's blameless, but he's not perfect. I don't know. There's questions that I ask. I'm not going to answer the question. I'll let you guys research and Kind of come up with that conclusion. But I do always ask the questions. Zachariah and, and, and Elizabeth were not perfect or seemingly not perfect, but they could not be condemned in their walk. Therefore, they were blameless. And so that lead, led me to distinguish the difference between being perfect and being blameless. Did Yahshua already <coughs> anticipate or know that this walk was going to get extremely hard and more difficult as we went along, as they went along, as time went along and people went along, to where it's just commanding you to be blameless? Perfection is too hard. What is the next step? What is the next thing? Now, am I asking you to shoot towards being blameless? No. Shoot for the moon. <laughs> if you don't hear it, where are you? <laughs> I'm saying you're amongst the stars. But shoot for being perfect. Your goal to achieve is to be perfect in all your ways, in all your heart, in all your soul, in all your spirit, and in all your mind. Be perfect. Yes, perfect. You should be on all your words. In yeah. all your words. Read Proverbs 25 11. I think I'm going there, but. Since you said, you said it, we're going to go there. Proverbs 25 11. Proverbs 25 11. 
I'm going to turn right there, but I did. Proverbs 25 11 says, A word filthy spoken is like apples of gold in the picture of silver. Is that it? That's yeah. And then there's also the warning in James 3 about your words, but what this seems to me, if I understand this passage correctly, is no matter how other how good other words are in their setting, let your words be the best. Let your words be the gold words. Yeah. You have you have the good words, the choice words. And that's something and going back to my process of perfection. Comes out of here, that kept, that's goes to here. That's why you got to clean your heart. Goes to here, that. comes out of yeah, here, comes right. out through here. <laughs> that's all first things first. Yeah. yeah, first things first. You're not going to clean up your words without cleaning out your heart. Yeah. And so, yeah. My, in my mind, I do work backwards. Action, speech, mind, heart. But some people like to work yeah. going forward. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Tom, what are you going to say? Something? I was going to say after when, when Kel was talking earlier about this contrast and passing this subject, it really struck me, was Moses, Moshe, blameless when he was in that humorous encounter with pre-incarnate, I believe, Yahshua, and he's saying, I'm a man that's inadequate, I, I'm a stammering lips, and he's told to take his, really humorous, take his hand and put it in his tunic and pull it out, and he's either leprous, white, or back in his normal, <laughs> The humor is so wonderful about prayer. He says, am I not the one that made the mouth? <laughs> Can I make you talk like? So was he blameless, but he didn't have that perfect faith right. and trust at that time? That is a good example. And that something I didn't even think about or put in the notes here is having a perfect faith. I go, kind of attribute that to having a perfect spirit. But sometimes we think it's too impossible for Yahweh. There are certain situations where, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't think if I fall off this cliff, he's going to protect me. Now, we shouldn't tempt Yahweh. I'm <laughs> jumping off the cliff, but there are certain situations that seem too overwhelming with us, for us. And if we doubt Yahweh's ability, are we perfect at that, from that point on? No. We're not perfect in our ways, we're not perfect in our heart, we're not perfect in our spirit. So perfection is really hard. But if you get in that situation and you do a certain thing and you doubt Yahweh, but immediately you turn around and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to lay it in his hands and have faith in Yahweh. It is going to get done. And you wholeheartedly move forward regardless, not worrying anymore about what is said or what is done or what could happen. Then you are held blameless. You wasn't perfect, but you turned it around. And now you're blameless. Yes, Trey. Um, kind of putting together a lot of stuff that you've been saying here. I kind of think um, righteousness and perfection are synonymous right there. Because when you go back to Genesis 15 6 with Abraham, it says that he, was, uh, he believed Yahweh and it was credited to him as righteousness. Yeah. That's how we read about him being perfect and then walk further, which we know has to be true because the promise was kept to him. So then when we go to Romans 5, it talks about um, being just, justified by faith, or in some version it says, therefore being righteous, we have the peace of all of you through our master, especially on the side, who we have access by faith to this grace where we stand to rejoice in hope and the magnificence of Elohim. So kind of put it together, it seems like you said earlier, if I'm uh, correct, that you're declared perfect by Yahweh. And we also read that you're declared righteous by Yahweh. And for us to be righteous, we have to have that spirit of Yahweh in us because that's, that's the true righteousness. And we also know that Yahweh is perfection. So if we're putting it together, um, justified by faith, and this is how we get that access to the perfection or to righteousness, which would be through grace. So I feel like, um, I don't know if you, when you did your study, how you looked at it, but also, if we look into the word righteousness, see how much that comes up with. I think it just was more focused on that term after Joshua came. But even the Old Testament, it was, I feel like it's kind of synonymous. It'll go back and forth between being perfect and being righteous. Because, um, like you said earlier as well, God's word um, or the law, it converts the soul and it's perfect. 
and the conversion of our soul would be converting to righteousness for the striving to go for, which would be the perfection of the strong as well. I know I just a whole lot. Yeah, let me try to digest what you just said. So, so, paraphrasing, righteousness is not so much of a result of being perfect. Righteousness, I think, is a result of being perfect in Yahweh's law and will. So you have to know his law will do it to be considered righteous. And so, yes, righteousness is a result of being perfect with Yahweh by doing his, those actions and then taking it that step further, as I mentioned, your heart that is a righteous person and that is perfect yes Curtis actually can I talk to a couple more verses about go ahead I'm, well, I didn't anticipate finishing so go <laughs> <All right. laughs> let's try Proverbs uh, 15 23 please good go ahead since you're there Proverbs man is going by the answer of his mouth and the word spoken in due season how good it is and that was Proverbs 1523. 1523. Let's try uh, Isaiah 50 verse 4. Isaiah 50 verse 4. As now Yahweh has given me the tongue of the learned, I should know how to speak. I mean, we know we're, we know we're talking about it. Yes. So to speak. The word in season to him is, a word in season to him who is weary, he awakens me morning by morning, and he wakes me he wakens me, and he wakens my ear to hear as the learning. Mm -hmm. yep. Sorry, I'm struggling with my glasses here. But... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Lon, go ahead. Uh, e Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Ephesians 4. And, and before you read it, uh, it is referring to someone like yourself, who is a pastor, who, who e equips us <coughs> or gives us the uh, the tools that's necessary to strive for that perfection or, or, or to, to manifest as that uh, perfection yes. through, yeah. through the, the teaching that you give us. Exactly. Ephesians 4, 11. Thank you, Mom, for it's bringing 13. this one up. 11 to 13. Ephesians 4, 11, if you guys are there. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of Yahweh until a perfect man until the measure of the statue of the fullness of Messiah all of us have our gifts that we've been given all of us have given our assignments and so it is our job to make those assignments perfect. Can't see back there. All right, Lot. Luke two twenty five. It just kind of goes with what Terry was saying about righteousness. Thank you, Luke two twenty five. Kind of goes. It goes with what Terry was saying about righteousness. And I think when you're saying perfect, you're saying blameless. Yes. Righteousness is also from I see blameless. So it kind of goes with it. And it says, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the set apart spirits upon him. Now that word just is also righteous. Right. So blameless, blameless. perfect. His walk with Yahweh couldn't be condemned. Yeah. Uh, okay. One more text about uh, blameless and perfect. James 3 2. James 3, verse 2 2. We all stumble with many things, but he who does not stumble with his words, he is a perfect man. He is also able to bridle his whole body. Yeah, you can bridle the tongue, you can bridle the whole body. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, it's a part of the walk, the walk that we are striving to be perfect. And obviously, there will be bumps in the road, and after that bump, it is our strive to be blameless, or as Brother Lawton just mentioned, to be righteous or just, so that we cannot be condemned in Yahweh. I only have time for one more verse, and I only made it to the second page, so <laughs> time goes by fast when you're having fun. That's right. uh, Matthew 12, 1. 
that's who he is. Um, Yahshua was worried. Matthew 12, 1. <clears throat> and we're going to wrap it up. I don't think I'm going to make it past that. <laughs> Matthew 12, verse 1. And at that time, Yahshua went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungry, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, and Yahshua responded back to them, Have ye not read what David did? When he was on hunger, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of Elohim, and did eat the showbread, which it was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. And I'll stop there. So I asked myself the question, was David perfect? Was David perfect? No. No. But he wasn't repentant. But he was repentant. So his ordeal with Bathsheba and her husband, that ain't perfect either at all. Thing here that's mentioned, but he did with the showbread and only made, you know, basically assigned to the priest that was not perfect. But did Yahweh love David? Yes. Yes. Because what did he do? He repented. Yes, and then do it again. So he knew the mercies of Yahweh. He knew the forgiveness that Yahweh had and his repentance and not doing it again. So that left him blameless. Yes. The Apostle Paul seems to be such a good example of that, brother, because he, he is transparent and honest and says, in contrast, as far as touching the Torah, Sending many others in the traditions of the fathers, he said in Galatians 1. And, and he had the tradition of the father, but he also exceeding many in. And those of those traditions were out of sync with Torah. As far as touching the law, he was blameless. Mm -hmm. But it took a supernatural intervention from the side. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was functioning blameless, but he had to be perfected by Messiah. Yeah, and he changed. He had to be basically giving the understanding that there's something greater than what you're doing yeah. and it's Messiah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was just going to read our song you know, creating me a clean heart. It's from Psalms so I'm guessing David wrote it. Yes. That uh, renew a right spirit within me and you know um, think not that Holy Spirit from me right mm -hmm. and restore him by joy of salvation. So creating me a clean going heart. Going back to what Cookie said. Yes. Psalm 51. So uh, yes yeah. Oh, I'm just going to say, I'm sure I don't have the reference, I think it's in Hebrews, but y'all can, you know, you know, it, you know, the train was uh, talking about the faith and the sign of when we do sin, because we're going to sin, it's not our goal to sin, but we're not perfect, but when we do sin, we have an advocate, and that's Yeshua, who yes. sits at the right hand, and that's where we enter into the blameless. That's it. That's where we're going. Let's go there. <laughs> Let's keep going there. So, yes. And I'm, I'm glad, even though you haven't been with us very long, is what I'm speaking about, it resonates and it oh, yeah. allows us to think through the process. We know all of this stuff. And we're told that the Center of our Spirit will bring it to remembrance yeah. whenever we need it. And so the fact that we're sparking conversations that's leading us exactly where I was going, and that's my last verse, is we have Yahshua. Yes. To cover those sins, even though we are not perfect, it is our job to be blameless. And in that blameless, we have him at our Yeah, he's interceding for us yes. right now. Yeah. Right we still have a lot to do. Yeah. Not saying that we well, don't have anything to do. I'm not saying that. It's just he is our perfecter. He yes. is our he's our perfecter. That's that's what we're going to Let's read his word. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Uh, where did I leave off? Verse 5. Matthew 12, verse 5. So, talk about David. David, after mm -hmm. Yahweh's eye, you know, even though he did bad things wrong, he wasn't perfect. 
But what is he going on to say about David and, you know, I'm assuming the priest here as well in verse 5? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priest and the temple profane the Sabbath are and are blameless? Oh, right. Very good. And so then, you know, obviously I'm going to ask questions, a bunch of questions. If Yahshua is telling them that, hey, here are situations of where people are doing things that is contrary to either what scripture says or what, as the Pharisees was talking about, what is customary for them. But Yahshua is saying that they are blameless. Who's the judge? Yahshua. Yes. Who makes that decision? Yahshua. Who will have mercy on those he will have mercy on? Through the Father. Yahshua. And so we have to think about that. If they, the Pharisees, were out there to condemn and to blame, blame. the condemnation, the accusations, the blaming of the people, Yeshua said, hey, they're blameless. And then he follows it up with the next verse, the next two verses. But I say unto you that the place, uh, this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifices. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. Now, I was going to do this whole thing about what that meant. It's from Hosea 6.6, 6, and it's Yah Yahweh saying that he would rather anyone has mercy yes. as opposed to sacrifices or doing the letter of the law. So to speak. Right. Right. And why is mercy so important? <clears throat> because we just talked about it. None of us are perfect. Before we even count on this walk, we needed his mercy. And because of his mercy, and you don't have to turn to Titus 3, 2, not by our works or our righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Yes. That's the only reason we're saved. Yes. Because of his mercy. Because most of us in this room have not been perfect. And are not perfect. But we strive to be blameless. And if we have mercy on each other, who will have mercy on us? Yahweh. Be merciful. It's our kingdom. He'll let us in if we are merciful to one another. Because if we judge one another, that same measure of judgment will be portrayed on us. So I would rather forgive everybody <laughs> yes. and be merciful to everybody than to go around condemning people. And then when I turn around and Yahshua is standing before the judgment seat, he's just like asking people and talking to people about this, what did you do? You're talking about this, what did you do? Talking, and my laundry list is this long of things that I have actually have accused other people of, and I am going to be accused. And if I didn't do 100%, which I know I have not, how about I just shorten that list? That way I had as much mercy as you did for all of my government. <laughs> Forgiving and forgetting all of the bad things that was done to me, that has happened to me, so that I can be held blameless. And that's what he's trying to tell them here. They're just walking around the town looking to accuse people. You're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. You're not looking at themselves. And I had a whole section about that. <clears throat> Making their measure that much more when they stand before Yahshua instead of saying, hey, you know what? I saw that your you know, disciples, apostles are eating grain here. You know, what is your thoughts on the Sabbath and what they're doing? Not judging, but what are your thoughts? And he would have told them and explained, and they would not have gone around condemning. But here's the kicker, verse 8, and I'll close out with this. Verse 8, Yeshua told them, 
For the Son of Man is master even of the Sabbath. So how can we, as just normal everyday people that are not perfect, go around condemning others for what they do instead of forgiving and having mercy, which is what Yahshua and Yahweh is doing every day of our lives. Our thoughts, our heart, our mind, our actions, everything we do, he's forgiving us every day of our lives for our discretions. And we should do that for one another. Until we make it to perfection, because it's attainable, or, or so that we can all, including the, including the accusers, be held blameless. So, I know you want to say James 2.13. James 2.13. Half-brother of Yahshua. James 2, verse 13. We'll close out with that. James 2, verse 13. Uh, James 2 verse 13 says, For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Oh, it triumphs <coughs> over judgment. Mercy triumphs over all. It's more important than all. All of the things that we know and do and all of that stuff, because it is Yahweh and it is of love. He loved us, so he sent his son. He loved us, so he allowed us to be a part of the family. Even though we were, at one point, not worthy. So it's our job to love one another, just as he loved us, and showing mercy for one of us. Again, so we can be blameless. All right, I think I'm waiting over time. I don't know how I'm gonna upload this, but any questions, or comments? <laughs> <clears throat> yes. To read well. Uh trade first and then to read to us. Okay. Um give me short. All right. <laughs> I actually um funny I'm looking at it to the contrary that I believe on I don't think that the righteousness will be a result of perfection, but that the perfection will result of righteousness. Because as we come as we keep reading here about um being justified by faith and by his grace. So when we come into this walk and you get immersed in everything, you don't come in perfect, but once you become immersed in, okay, at that moment, you're essentially like you're reborn, you're coming back in, you know, and now at that moment, you're building a spirit, you declare righteous, but you've not been perfect up to that point. You might be declared righteous at that point, because if you die and you are repentant, but someone has all the way to the dying breath. And if they repent and they are, you know, they truly mean it and they turn, you know, they take on the blood of Messiah, they're now declared righteous and can be accepted to the kingdom, but at the same time, they have not been perfect their whole life. But once we reach that righteousness, we will try to go towards perfection. Even how, um, and it's like even more so when you're talking about the Pharisees, is that they were blameless. So I feel like that's, that's where it goes from the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law would be perfection and righteousness, uh, perfection through righteousness, but the letter of the law would be being blameless. So we should always strive be perfect, like you said, but we have to reach righteousness before we can become perfect, because we have to have that clean slate, which can't be done until he declares the righteousness, which means he builds up the spirit and works on us on our path, and then we face those trials and tribulations so that we can strive for that perfection afterwards. Not that I'm like fully this, I'm just saying I feel like it's, it's kind of the contrary of that you have to be righteous before you can reach uh, for perfection, not the other way around, where nobody will be able to get to the fault. Thank you for that, Trey. Uh, Lot, really quick. <laughs> We're way over time right now. Or, oh, no, uh, Dimitri did. Sorry. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Um, just want to mention, as we were to be perfect, also, um, we'll be imperfect in our heart. And then, um, in the resurrection, for the resurrection, actually, is going to change our physical body to make us completely perfect. And so I want to mention that, and then there's two verses I want to mention. Uh, let's see. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, 
It says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And the next verse is Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. It says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of Elohim, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. I'm glad you mentioned that. I did have that on my third page. I just didn't make it. <laughs> so many. Yeah, and I did say I want uh, new stuff. Yeah, yeah, what's the time on? Hour and 20. Okay, yeah. 